Okay, a blessed morning to all, to everybody. I'm so glad to uh, see you all again. And uh, today we're going to uh, talk about a uh, wonderful love story. Although a bloody, gruesome, and uh, a tragic love story. And no, I'm not talking about Romeo and Juliet. And uh, I'm not even talking about the Titanic. But uh, to remind you, uh, this love story is not for the faint-hearted, but this one is an epic love story. One of my uh, Filipino political heroes once said that um, I've long held the belief that as a leader, I cannot ask you or I cannot ask of you something that I cannot do myself. And I cannot impose on you values that I don't live out so that was said that by uh, it was said by jesse uh, robredo our uh, former uh, department of interior local government secretary you know, someone a thousand years ago did exactly just that he asked something that he himself did he lived out values that he asked you and i to live out as well so this morning, my dear brethren, we will look into the most incredible story of love and human sacrifice. How far one person will go for another individual. So our topic for this morning will be a story of an ordinary man and his extraordinary love. Heavens best gift to mankind. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, the Bible said um, in the reading, in the scripture reading about Matthew chapter 5, particularly in verse 41, the Bible said, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You know, Jesus did just that. An ordinary man, Jesus was forced to walk, though not a mile, but roughly 600 meters plus, and with the cross to bear over his shoulder. That cross, according to history, some experts weigh about 80 to 110 pounds. Can you imagine Jesus? weighing that on his, uh, carrying that on his shoulder, you know, with that kind of weight, even for a shorter distance, it seems like Jesus covered more than two miles. In Matthew chapter five, verse 40, the Bible said, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, Hand over your coat as well. And Jesus did just that. An ordinary man, Jesus was wrongfully accused and had given his cloth as well. In Mark chapter 14, verse 57, then some stood up and gave false testimony against him. You know, the soldiers took his clothes, divided them into each other, and they even cast lots for his inner garments. We can read that in John chapter 19, verses uh, 23 down to 24. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, and they said, let's not tear it. They said to one another, let's decide by a lot who will get it. So they, they, this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. You know, even if Jesus weren't crucified, he would have given his clothes to the soldiers, you know, if they would just ask for it. 
but they did took off his clothes they cast a lot on it on who will get his clothes in Matthew chapter 5 verse 39 the bible said but i tell you do not resist an evil person and jesus did just that an ordinary man jesus did not resist evil he didn't even bother not to ask his apostles and followers for an uprising or coup d'etat or he didn't even ask his apostles and his followers to make a plan to snatch him away from his captors in fact the bible said in uh, in isaiah chapter 53 he was oppressed and afflicted jesus did not even open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a ship that is silent before its shearers so he did not open his mouth jesus did not resist this evil things that is about to happen to him in first peter chapter 2 22 and 23 he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth now listen to this he did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered he left his case in the hands of God, who always judge fairly. In Matthew chapter 5, now in that same verse, in verse 39, the Lord said, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them to the other cheek. Turn to them the other cheek also. Now, Jesus, again, did just that an ordinary man jesus not only turned the other cheek he gave his back he gave his side he gave his feet he gave his hands and his head you know i think he gave every inch of his body for you and i isaiah chapter 50 verse 6 have this to say i gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard i hid not my face from disgrace and spitting and in mark chapter 14 and 15 you know the bible said they began to spit at him that the soldiers began spitting at him and they blindfolded him they struck him with their fist and they even said, prophecy, who hits you? You know, the guards took, uh, took their turn beating and punching our Lord Jesus Christ. Waiting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate releases Barabbas to them. And he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And then after that, they put a, a purple robe on him then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail the king, uh, king of the Jews. But after beating him, they held insult at him. Again and again, they struck him on the head with the staff, rod, and spit on him, hitting him on his cheek, on his face, and falling on their knees, they paid homage to him now i want to uh, to bring out a picture of what they did to jesus christ the scourging of jesus and the uh, the flag room or flagellum or whip as they call it you know according to a medical account of jesus crucifixion by uh, a certain uh, douglas jacoby a man to be plugged he was strip of his clothes and his hands are tied to a post above his head just like the photo that you are seeing right now he was then whipped across the shoulders back buttocks you know, ties legs and the whip they used was designed to make a devastating punishment bringing the victim close to death and several uh short heavy leather tongs with two small 
uh, balls of lead or iron are attached near the end of each, and the pieces of ship's bones were sometimes included. As the scourging proceeds, it cuts deeper and deeper on Jesus' skin and producing heavy bleeding. The fragment of ship's uh, bones rip the flesh as, they, as the whip, you know, as the whip is drawn back and forth. The wound or the words chosen by, uh, by the apostle, by the gospel writers, suggest that the scourging of Jesus was particularly so severe. He was certainly at the point of, uh, of collapse when he was cut down from the flagging post. And one particular doctor that I've read over the internet, he commented that uh, if one would sew the wounds of Jesus, put patches you know, or stitches to close the wounds of Jesus, Jesus would look like Frankenstein. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the wounds that Jesus had all over his body? And guess what the Bible said? By his wounds, we are healed. In Isaiah chapter 53. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. And Jesus did just that. An ordinary man, Jesus did take up his own cross. Again, his cross was weighing around 80 to 110 pounds. And he was also given a crown to match his cross, a crown made up of thorns, that is. You know, Jesus walked under one kilometer under the scourging heat of the sun from the old city of Jerusalem to Golgotha or Calvary through the road called Via Dolorosa or the Way of Sorrows. And because of exhaustion and being badly beaten, Jesus fell down while carrying his cross. And a bystander by the name of Simon of Cyrene was asked to carry it for him. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44, particularly in verse 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus did just that. An ordinary man, Jesus loved everybody. He dined with sinners. He was in the company of those who hated him. But what was moving when Jesus said in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Come on. Nothing is so incredible than that. Jesus praying for all of us. Jesus praying for those who persecute him. You know, every time I got to talk about this uh, sufferings, crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, I got so emotional, too emotional, you know, because of what they did to my Lord, to your Lord Jesus Christ. You know, hanging on the cross, about to die. He prayed for forgiveness for those who persecute him. Just wow. In John chapter 15, verse 13, the Bible said, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus did just that. An ordinary man, Jesus laid down, laid down his life for us, for you and I. Now, let's take a further look at Christ, uh, Christ's sufferings leading to his death. Let's start off when he prayed at the Mount of Olives in Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Jesus prayed in Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, the prayer of Jesus Christ, he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, 
not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Sweat like blood. Can you imagine that? A condition known as hematodrysis. I don't know if I get that right. No. A very rare medical condition that causes to ooze or sweat uh, blood from your skin occurring under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress, distress or fear, such as facing death, torture, or severe ongoing abuse. Your capillaries, blood vessels that feed the sweat glands will rupture, causing them to exude blood. Now, Jesus is just one of the handful who experienced this phenomenon. I think um, he's probably just the fifth person to experience this. Can you just imagine the emotional stress Jesus felt at that time, knowing his time, his death is about to happen. So much stress that his capillaries ruptured, exude blood that his sweat was like blood. Now, I don't know if someone here went into the same emotional stress as Jesus did, that even an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Can you just imagine the severity of the stress upon Jesus at the time? Sweat like blood, angel coming down to strengthen him. We saw that he was beaten. He was beaten by a Roman soldiers. A Roman soldier, let me remind you that these soldiers are trained for combat, close combat. Their physique is so ripped. One expert commented that a single blow from the soldiers is enough to inflict so much damage that it can even so that it can be so fatal to kill a person. So can you imagine just one blow? But Jesus did not receive just one blow. He received many blows from the soldiers. Now I want us to use our imagination for a while on this. He was so badly beaten that Isaiah have this to say about what Jesus looked like in Isaiah chapter 52, particularly in verse 14. I have here two translations. Isaiah 52, verse 14. Many were horrified at what happened to him, but everyone who saw him was even more horrified because he suffered until he no longer looked human. Wow. The other translations read or read, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured. He seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. Imagine what they did to our beloved Jesus. They disfigured his face and people was horrified. And when they saw him, they were horrified at him. He was unrecognizable. Wow. Come on. They're just terrible. Very, very terrible. Very tragic what they did to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is just one of the handful or um, well, the soldiers. After beating him, the soldiers take a bundle of a long, sharp, strong thorns and having woven them into crown, forcing and pressing it upon Jesus' head and piercing the head of Jesus on every side and blood starts dripping. An expert said, that uh, this thorn was so sharp that it can pierce through a tin can. Can you imagine that? Now, let's go to the nails of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' nails would have been made of heavy, squared iron cast materials. And its length is around seven to nine inches long. Many scholars and experts believe that contrary to popular belief, the nails which held Jesus to the cross must have been driven into his wrist and not his palms. They also noted that it would be 
are medically impossible for a full grown man to be suspended with nails on his palms and not fall down. So they said that Jesus was nailed through his wrist and every pound of that hammer to that nail is sure is excruciating. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, the Bible said, Who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. This particular verse is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus made himself nothing. Can you imagine that? Jesus stripped himself of being God for 33 years. He was nothing. He is not God, but God working through him. And the verse said, by taking the very nature of a servant. You know, Jesus could have been born differently. He could have been born son of a king. He could have been born son of a prince, living in a kingdom with many servants at his disposal. And he could even been born as a joke. No, but man, Jesus took on the lowest of the lowest rank. A servant. He was a servant. He served you and I. And the verse said, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, Jesus, he handed over to us in a silver platter, or may I say, in a silver bloody platter, the keys to heaven when he gave himself on that cross. All we have to do now is enjoy life, live it to the fullest, as he himself, uh, he himself said that he wants us to have an abundant life. So we just have to live in accordance to his will. Ultimately, our Savior succumbed to death. Just to make sure that he is dead, he was pierced at his side, then immediately there came out blood and water. Isaiah 53, verse 5, it states, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And his, by his wounds, we are healed. John 3.16 tells us God's perfect gift to mankind. And this verse will tell us more about love. John 3.16 states, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Agape love or agape is God's perfect love unconditional and sacrificial love for humanity. If we are going to break down John 3.16 for a moment and very briefly, we can learn a bit more. John 3.16 the Bible said, for God so loved the world. It's a universal love. God's love is for everybody. No, no one is, is exempted. No. It's for everybody. That's why it's called universal, universal love. And it goes on to say that God's love is being universal and God's love is a sacrificial love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Sacrificial kind of love. God sacrifices his son because he loved us so much. And Jesus sacrifices himself because he loved God and he loved us so much as well. Sacrificial kind of love. That whosoever believes in him my part for the unconditional love, your part for the unconditional love, that whoever believes 
in Him. We need to do something. Jesus' love is for everyone. But we need to do something. And that something is that we must believe in Jesus. But underneath the believing, there's more to it than just believing. We need to learn of His ways. We need to be baptized. And we need to continue living out whatever his, He instructed us in the Bible. So our part for the, for the unconditional love is that we must believe in Him. So for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. The discipline of love. Out of God's love, He will discipline us because He doesn't want us to perish. For the Lord disciplines those He loves. And he punishes each one. He accepts as his child in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. That's why he is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but come to repentance, according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And as the verse, John 3, 16 continues, he doesn't want us to perish, but have eternal life. Have eternal life that is the gift of love. Because of God's love, He's offering us eternal life in heaven. My dear brothers and sisters, as we can clearly see, Jesus will never ask something He Himself cannot do and will not do. He will not impose on us values that He didn't live out Himself. Jesus did everything. He asked of us to do so that we don't have any excuses. He told us to turn the other cheek, and he did just that. He told us to carry up our cross, and he did just that. Everything he told us to do, he did it so that we won't have any excuses. He gave his life. He lost his life so that we can gain ours. We enjoy every bit of what we have now because of Jesus. We showed love to our husband, to our wife, to our children, to our brethren, because God showed love to us first. In 1 John chapter 14, uh, chapter 4, verse 19, you know, we love because he first loved us. And love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning, atoning sacrifice for our sins in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. You know, Jesus was nothing when he was in this world. He was just an ordinary man. An ordinary man, but with an extraordinary love for his father in heaven and for humanity. He was obedient to his father all throughout, up until his last breath. Every first day of the week like this, as we all gather together, we do not only listen to God's message or sing or pray or give. We gather to be reminded every week of God's amazing love and Jesus' sacrifice as we partake of the Lord's Supper, his body and his blood. His life for us to give us freedom and to give us heaven. Now, for just a moment, I want to do this um, and I want everybody to participate. So, can you just say, I love you to whoever is there with you right now? Come on, say it to the person who is with you. To my wife, I love you. He's li she's listening right now. <laughs> Thank you. Now, can you say to each other, God loves you so much, Jesus died for you. Can you say that to one another? God loves you so much, my dear, Jesus died for you. And finally, finally, can we say this? Thank you, Jesus, and I love you. Can we all say that? Thank you, Jesus, and I love you. All right. How does it feel? Feels mighty good, isn't it? Feels good. You know, saying out loud, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, thank you. 
it really makes me feel great. I hope you too, you feel great as well. As we live our day-to-day -day lives, let's spread this love of God and Jesus' sacrifice to our friends. Let us share the sacrifice of Jesus. The Bible encourages us not just to love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, let's live out the values. Let's live out the integrity that the Lord wants us to live. Let's be the light and salt of this world. You know, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light, and it's you. How can we not love and be proud of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who became an ordinary man with an extraordinary love, a heaven's best gift to mankind? Now, my dear brothers and sisters, if some of you here today are having a rough time and needing prayers, or just needed someone to talk to, give the elders a call or any of your brethren. Our goal is ultimately heaven. If you haven't accepted the Lord, let your voice be heard now. Let the leadership of this congregation guide you in your journey. Accepting Jesus is the most wonderful thing you will ever do in your life. I want to greet you all a blessed day. Thank you very much and God bless everybody.